In this video, we'll be going over the use of arrays. So let's start by addressing what an array actually is. You can think of it as a variable that contains more than one data item. For example, let's say we wanted to store a list of names, which would, of course would be strings. We can do that by allocating a contiguous part of memory for the purpose of storing that data. Contiguous simply means that all the data is stored together, one element after another. Now you may hear lists being thrown about, and indeed Python's version of arrays, close enough in an abstract sense, are arrays. Lists are technically different though in a number of ways, which are beyond the scope of this course, because lists don't have to be contiguous. Our program will know the position in memory where our array starts, in this case, address 05. The program then uses an index relative to the start point to allow us to easily access the array's contents. So Jane is at index 2. In this situation, we've started the index at 0, which is quite common. So let's actually have a look then at example of a one dimensional array and here we're using Python. So this first line sets up the one dimensional array of strings and it calls that array countries. It assigns it the initial values. So at index zero, we have Angola, index one is Austria and two is Belgium. And note how here indexes are starting at zero and not one. Now, as we said before, Python actually uses arrays, but allows programmers to use them as lists. And that's why most people think Python only supports lists. Now, this distinction and difference is not something you need to worry about. They'll be using the word arrays in exams, so stick with that. To output Austria from the array, we would need to use index one, as index one represents the second item in the country's array. Arrays can be thought of as static data structures. That means you can't change the size of an array once you've set it up. Now, this is actually a good example of Python allowing an array to behave like a list. Although you can't tell because it's abstracted from you, Python's actually moving the entire data structure to a new part of memory to ensure it's contiguous if it needs to be. But all that is hidden from you as the programmer. We can then insert an item into the new location at the end of the array using its index. Now in the exam, you need to be able to use both one and what we call two dimensional arrays. Now you can visualize a two dimensional array as a table with two sets of indexes, one for the rows and another for the columns. Otherwise it works in exactly the same way. So here we can see we've got countries zero, zero, and we're supplying two indexes and that contains the data item, uh, item Angola. Whereas countries 01 contains the value 1246700. And likewise, countries 11 contains the value 83871. As with all the other coded examples we've given you so far, it's important you understand how arrays will look in your exam paper following the Cambridge IGCC pseudocode format. Now there's quite a bit on the screen here, but we're showing you examples of how you declare a 1D and 2D array. We're then showing you some examples of how you assign 
values to the array. And then we're showing you a simple loop at the bottom there that's looping through the individual element of an array. So that's everything you need to know for your exam. Pause the video and take some notes. Well, that's everything you need to know about arrays for the IGCC specification. But if you want to know a little bit more, pop your pen down and we've got about another minute of extra stuff for you. So we've already gone through the fact that the exam board needed to know about both one dimensional and two dimensional arrays. And there's a visualization on the screen there of how you can think about them. Of course, there's nothing stopping arrays going beyond two dimensions. Here we have a three dimensional array and you can quite easily visualize that as a cube. We're just adding now a third index. If we wanted to access a given element of this three dimensional array, we would supply three indexes in our visualization, one for the height, one for the width, and one to the depth inside this cube. Now at that point, you might think we can't go any further. Um, how can we visualize say a fourth and fifth dimensional array? Well, Computers have no problem. They don't need to visualize them. And there's nothing wrong with having four, five, six, and even higher dimensional arrays. And actually, visualizing them is probably not quite as hard as you think. So here's one way you could use to visualize a fourth dimensional array. Our fourth index is just being used to represent which one of the cubes. And then within that cube, we're using the three other indexes to give us our exact position within the cube. Likewise, a fifth dimensional array is now just showing all the cubes arranged in a grid. Two of the indexes will be used to specify which row and column of the cube we want to be using. And then the next three indexes will be used to find the item within that cube. We can keep going on like this, but we think you've got the idea.